you have any questions throughout the, throughout the presentation, um, feel free to um, enter into the chat. Um, and if you could please try to keep yourself muted uh, throughout the presentation just to avoid any background noise. If you want to unmute yourself at the end when um, we have time for questions, you can feel free to do that. Um, so first of all, my name is Franny Jurdy. I'm with the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm the urban conservationist. And tonight um, I'm going to talk to you all about the benefits of native plants. And it is a jam-packed presentation, so we'll get right into it. So first of all, what is a native plant? Um, they are plants that occur naturally in a particular region without human introduction. So typically we, um, we categorize them as plants that have been here since pre-settlement. So they have evolved in an area for tens of thousands of years, which makes them adaptable to that particular climate. So they are adapted to that soil, the amount of precipitation they receive, um, the, they can uh, adapt to the harsh climates like in Minnesota, we have pretty hot and dry summers and very cold and snowy winters. So we need to have hardy plants that can handle that. Um, and because they are so adapted to their region, they require very little inputs um, because they can, they can get those inputs on their own. Um, and I included this map here with kind of the three general breakdowns of the um, native plant communities of Minnesota. Um, and so in the, the um, western portion of the state, it's mostly upland dry prairie. Um, and then that center swath going down to the east uh, part of the state is our, our hardwood forest. And then the northern part of the state uh, near the arrowhead, that's our boreal forest with uh, mostly conifers. And so the map is pretty zoomed out, obviously, but Sherburne County, um, let's see if you can see my cursor, is right here. And so we kind of have a little swath over to the west that is our upland prairie habitat. And then the rest of the county is um, oak woodland or brushland, which mainly it's oak savanna habitat. Um, so kind of oak trees sprawled out with enough sunlight getting through the canopy to allow um, dry prairie uh, plants to grow in the understory. So very dry in Sherburne County. Uh, if you live here, you probably know that. Very sandy soil. Um, and so I wanted to kind of differentiate the difference between native plants and cultivars um, and why we're you know, trying to focus on getting landowners to incorporate more native plants into their landscaping. And a cultivar is a plant variety that's been produced in cultivation by selective breeding. It's usually propagated vegetatively, um, which essentially means it's a clone of a parent plant. And so there's no genetic diversity from that clone. So it makes it um, sorry, it makes it less adaptable um, to, to changes in the climate. And they're usually selected for traits that are desirable to people. And in that process, the desirable traits for pollinators or wildlife are usually bred out of them. Um, so they're usually bred to have longer blooms, double blooms, um, the, to have different kinds of flower colors, different growth habits, and to be pest resistant. Um, so the examples I have here, the photo on the left, I believe is a crab apple with double blooms. And double blooms makes it really hard or almost impossible for pollinators to get at the pollen and nectar resources if there are any. Um, and the photo on the right is a nine bark and we have native nine bark that have your typical green leaves. Um, and these uh, cultivars have been read to have this kind of dark maroon leaf color, which is very attractive to us people. Um, but uh, insects that usually feed on native nine bark, they can't feed on the maroon colored leaf nine bark because the, the color change has made the leaf toxic to them and it's not palatable. So it can be marketed as pest resistance. Uh, but for those native insects that need that food, they can no longer um, eat that plant. And aside from um, cultivars, you know, being changed so much that native um, pollinators and wildlife can't use them, 
There's also the issue of changing our local ecosystems with cultivars that escape. Um, and the photo on the left is probably one of the most well-known um, invasive species that started in the nursery trade, and that is buckthorn. So if any of you have woodlands on your property, you're probably very familiar with this plant. Um, it quickly escaped uh, cultivation and invaded most woodlands. It takes over entire understories out competing our native um, understory species, which makes forage for wildlife um, and pollinators very limited. And buckthorn has been here since the late 1800s, I believe it was brought over in the nursery trade, mainly as a hedgerow plant. And you can still find, um, you know, hedges of, of buckthorn um, from long ago. Uh, another plant that's luckily not um, very prevalent in Sherburne County yet is uh, wild parsnip. And it's this bright yellow uh, colored flower. It was also brought over in the 1800s as part of the nursery trade to be a landscape plant. Um, and aside from it um, taking over um, landscapes out competing our native species, it also serves or it, it has detrimental impacts on human health because there are compounds on all parts of the plants and the leaf system, the flowers and the roots that are very irritating and can cause pretty severe rashes on your skin that almost resemble third degree burns. Um, and wild parsnip typically shows up um, in disturbed areas along roadsides or um, more worrisome along like trails. So they can be uh, potentially dangerous to pedestrians uh, when they're trying to enjoy some nice recreation outside. So, um, most of this talk is going to be about the benefits of native plants, obviously. So I just wanted to just quickly go over the cultivars, um, but now we'll get back into native plants. Um, so they have a wide variety of benefits and some ecological benefits include, um, they provide erosion control and you'll see why on the next slide. They obviously provide habitat in the way of providing pollen and nectar resources for pollinators um, and, and other um, wildlife species as well. And water quality kind of goes hand in hand with erosion control. Um, the plants filters uh, runoff that's coming from upland before it gets into a surface water or also allows for infiltration into the ground to help recharge our aquifers. And so I love showing this uh, graphic whenever I'm talking about native plants because this really helps hit home why native plants are so important in our landscape, why they are so great at providing soil stabilization for restoration projects. It's because of their root systems. A lot of the magic is happening below ground. They have these dense fibrous root systems and you'll notice all of the different plant species kind of have different, um, different root systems. So they kind of stay in their own lane and they work together. So those are providing really deep channels to allow water to infiltrate into the ground. Um, they're creating habitat for um, microorganisms that are in the soil um, to help uh, increase soil health. Um, and they stabilize the soil. And I wanted to point out off to the left of that photo in that circle, that's Kentucky bluegrass. So that's our typical um, turf grass in most residential lawns. And so you can see the root structure of the Kentucky bluegrass doesn't even begin to compare to the native plants. And that is why our, our lawns require so many extra inputs. They need a lot of water and fertilizer because they can't get that on their own because of their very short root system. So speaking of lawn, I wanted to just quickly highlight um, you know, what our typical urban and suburban landscapes look like and how we can incorporate native plants into them to help uh, better our ecosystems and provide habitat for uh, pollinators and other wildlife. And so this is very typical of neighborhoods. Um, when developments occur, uh, the lots are completely converted into turf grass lawns. There might be you know, a few foundation plantings uh, near the house. You could probably count the number of plants on one hand in their most likely cultivars, so not really providing a lot of uh, habitat. And 
urban lawns actually cover about 40 million acres in the lower 48 states. And that's more land than our cultivated corn, wheat, and fruit trees combined. That's a lot of land. And so if everybody that has property with lawn just took a little bit and set it aside to plant native plants, we would have a lot more habitat for our pollinators and wildlife. Because even if a lawn looks nice and lush and green, it might as well be a desert to a pollinator because it doesn't have any of those benefits that they require. Um, so a little gloom and doom before I really get into um, some plant species uh, that um, are great for pollinators. Uh, it's well known that there is uh, a pollinator decline. Um, and it's been happening for you know, several decades because of pesticide use, habitat loss, um, introduction of foreign pests and disease and climate change. And the honeybee is probably the most well-known um, pollinator that's been struggling just because it's so well-documented. And honeybees are um, not native to the US, they are from Europe. Um, and so there are a lot of native pollinators that are experiencing the same decline. And I wanted to just highlight a few of those. And so first we have the rusty patch bumblebee. Now this bumblebee was the first bee to be listed as federally endangered. And actually um, since it's listing the state of Minnesota assigned it as our state bee back in 2018. So if you didn't know, we have a state bee and it is the rusty patch bumblebee and it gets its name from that little rusty patch on its abdomen. And I personally have never seen this bee. Uh, there are a few kind of lookalikes that have that same um, kind of reddish color around their abdomen. But at the, the map that I have here, the black outline shows its historic range. And the rusty patch bumblebee used to be a very common bee about uh, 20 years ago. Um, but now it's just found in pretty isolated populations. And luckily in Minnesota, we do have a pretty decent population kind of close to the, the metro area. Um, and so uh, ever since its listing, there have been a, a few programs uh, established to try to get more habitat to help increase the rusty patch bumblebee population. The next pollinator I wanna highlight also is um, of local concern. This is the Uncas skipper. Um, it may not be the showiest of butterflies, but uh, it's still very important. Um, you might recognize the name Uncas because it is found in the Uncas sand dunes um, in Sherburne County. And actually, uh, this map I have up here is um, from the DNR website. If you look up the Uncas skipper on the DNR website and its range, um, this is the map that pops up. And Sherburne County is the only county highlighted because the Uncas skipper is really only found in the Uncas sand dunes as a as, um, sustainable population. It is found kind of elsewhere scattered, but in the sand dunes, that's where it has um, a pretty decent population. But uh, because the, it, it, um, it requires that sand dune habitat, which is um, being altered um, as development closes in. And so there are some very specific plant species in that habitat that it relies on. And pollinators are very important. I feel like we all are very well aware of the pollinator um, uh, services that they provide in um, various aspects of our lives. Um, they're also important in the food web. Um, they're uh, you know, low end on the food web. So in their larval state, they provide a lot of food for many different wildlife species. And their pollinator services also extend beyond our food um, they provide pollination services that create food for um, many wildlife species. So all the fruits and nuts and seed um, in our native plants, that's thanks to pollinators and wildlife species depend on them, anything from a bear to um, a field mouse. Um, and then for our crop services, they provide about 29 billion in pollination services annually. Um, and this does include honeybees, but also native bees. Native bees have been shown to be very efficient pollinators, um, more so than honeybees in some cases, especially the bumblebee, because they buzz pollinate. So they vibrate their whole body and it shoots the pollen off of the plant onto the bee. Um, and they're really great at pollinating a lot of different crops like tomatoes. 
So if you're like me and you love having tomatoes in your garden, it's really great to incorporate native plants in your landscape to draw in those uh, really great pollinators that'll help pollinate your vegetables. And more than just pollinators um, in decline, birds are also in, in decline as a direct result of the declining pollinator um, population because birds require um, pollinators in their larval state to feed their young. And so take a chickadee, for example, you know, chickadee are pretty small birds, but they require six to 9,000 caterpillars just to rear one clutch of uh, young in a season. So that's a lot of caterpillars um, or other insect larvae. And so if you want to increase birds in your backyard, you better plant more native plants so you can draw in those pollinators that those birds rely on. And aside from songbirds, um, upland game birds also um, require insects to feed their young like grouse and turkey and pheasant. So when we're thinking about incorporating native plants into our landscape, we really want to think about diversity because there is a wide variety of different pollinators that those um, plants are providing for. And I love showing this graphic. It's a little busy, just like a bee, um, but you'll notice the variety of our native bees. These are all different kinds of bees. And I just wanna point out you know, some bees have these really long tongues, which um, make them great at pollinating flowers that have kind of longer tube shapes. Um, and then some bees have little short tongues that are great for pollinating more open flowers, um, like black-eyed Susans and sunflowers and things like that. So we always want to think diversity when we're planting, especially with native plants. So, now, uh, the next couple slides are really going to focus on pollinator plant powerhouses. So native plants that provide just a, a huge swath of benefits for a wide variety of pollinators. So many pollinators, pollinators visit all of these plants and they're really great to have in your landscape. So the first one is willow. I'm going to kind of start in the spring and work my way down to the fall. So willows, there are a wide variety of willows. Um, some willows that can even handle more drier soil like prairie willow, but then most of the willows like pussy willow and sandbar willow are the ones you typically see kind of on wetland edges and along shorelines. Um, they're a really early blooming shrub, so they provide pollinator um, resources for those early emerging po pollinators. Um, and they also provide food source for 14 species uh, that only specialize on willow. So willow is the only thing that they can gather nectar or pollen from. And they're also a larval host for a lot of different moth species like this Sopropia moth. The next is Virginia water leaf. It's, um, it's a short um, understory herbaceous flower uh, that blooms really early in the spring. So it's an excellent source of high quality nectar for bumblebee queens. Uh, bumblebee queens are the only ones that overwinter. So when they emerge in the spring, they need a lot of resources to um, fuel up uh, so they can um, search for a new nest uh, and provision it throughout the season. Um, and so Virginia water leaf gets its name from the little white specks on its leaves. Uh, and it's just a really great early spring plant. The next one are violets. There are a wide variety of violets, um, violets that do great in shade, violets that do great in more prairie-like settings. They come in a whole different uh, variety of colors. So you can pretty much find a violet for any situation you need. Even they can handle being in a lawn pretty well. Uh, they can handle foot traffic and, and mowing. They'll just remain really short. Um, and they are the host plant for 33 different species of butterfly, um, a lot of different fritillaries, um, like this is a regal fritillary, I believe. Um, and so, and, and they are, provide really great um, early nectar and pollen for those early emerging pollinator species. And some might even be emerging now, it's hard to believe, um, but having those early spring uh, flowers is really essential uh, because there are, they are usually lacking in resources around this time of year. So moving on into summer, prairie clovers are a really great source of 
pollen and nectar as well for a wide variety of bees and butterflies. They also are a larval host for several different butterfly species. And they're also in the legume family, so the pea family, and that they can um, uh, acquire nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it available in the soil. So that benefits all of the plants around them. They're kind of like self-fertilizing almost. So it's, it's a good addition to have in your landscape to help increase your soil health. Another summer flower or a variety of summer flowers are verveins. There are several different kinds native to Minnesota. The two main ones that we typically see are hoary vervain, which is the photo on the right, and then blue vervain uh, right next to it. Hoary vervain does better in dry, sandy soils, so um, it's a really great prairie plant. Um, and then um, conversely, blue vervain does better in uh, wetter soil, so it's really good um, to have along your shoreline or on a wetland edge. Um, and these verveins, they have long flowering periods because um, they kind of start at the bottom because they have a really tall spiky flower. They start at the bottom and they slowly bloom um, and work their way up to the top. So there is um, there are flowers blooming for a longer period of time than uh, a, a simple flower with just one uh, flower on the stalk. And so they provide pollinator resources, but birds also eat seeds in the winter. Um, and there's actually a, a specialist bee called the vervain bee, which is the photo I have here that only visits verveins. Another good summer plant is wild bergamot. This is a good plant to have if you have a, a large space or if you are okay with um, pulling a lot of uh, bergamot because they like to spread. So they're a really good pollinator plant um, in prairies and they have a lot of nectar and pollen resources for several different kinds of bees. They're also a host for several moths, but a whole wide variety of butterflies, hummingbirds, and other insects visit bergamot, um, like this uh, hummingbird moth here. The next uh, is kind of um, transitional between summer and fall plant, the blue giant hyssop. Um, it is in the mint family, so it has very aromatic leaves when you crush them. And because it has aromatic leaves, it makes them uh, not palatable to uh, herbivory. So uh, you won't have rabbits or deer or anything like that um, munching on this plant. So that's kind of an added benefit. Um, but they also provide really great um, nectar and pollen for bees and butterflies. And like vervain, they provide seeds for birds uh, in the wintertime as well. And um, hyssop, I, it, it's, I think it's mostly adapted to kind of more prairie-like settings, but I've definitely seen it in kind of um, medium, not quite shoreline type soils, but, but medium wet soils as well. So it's pretty adaptable to different habitat types. Full sun though. Now we're moving into the fall. And so goldenrods are, um, probably one of the best pollinator resources in the fall. And there are a wide variety of goldenrods, so you can find them that are well adapted to dry soils, to wet soils, to shade, full sun. There is a goldenrod for any type of habitat that you have. Um, and I, I always feel like I have to mention this when I talk about goldenrods because they have a bad reputation for causing allergies. And that's because they are blooming at the same time as ragweed. And ragweed is the main culprit for um, kind of late summer, early fall allergies. And it's because goldenrod's very showy, it's very yellow, it's very noticeable when people are having allergy issues. But ragweed has really light pollen that it um, is picked up by the wind very readily. And goldenrod pollen is actually very heavy. And so if it doesn't get um, picked up by a pollinator, it'll just sink to the ground. Um, so that goldenrod isn't the one causing allergies, so you can feel free to incorporate it into your landscape um, because it is very beneficial for pollinators. And aside from the pollen and nectar resources, native bees will use the stems um, to provision nests for their young and overwinter in them. 
All right, and we have asters. And like goldenrod, there are a, a wide variety of asters. You can basically find one to suit any habitat type. Um, like the, the purple aster here is New England aster that does really well on um, shorelines or wetland edges. It can get pretty tall. Um, there's also the white aster there. It's heath aster and it is much shorter and does better in uh, drier prairie type settings and has these small delicate white flowers. Um, like goldenrod, this is an excellent um, source for pollen and nectar in the fall. So we really want to still provide fall pollen and nectar sources for those pollinators that are either um, gearing up for migration or getting ready to um, hibernate for the winter. And uh, the asters are also a host plant for many different kinds of uh, butterfly species like this pearl crescent here. And I think this is the last um, flower example. Um, we have sunflowers. And I'm not talking about the sunflowers that get planted every year that you can go take photos with that um, are grown for their sunflower seed production. Um, we have a lot of different native sunflowers that aren't quite as large as those sunflowers, but they are still very showy. And we have several different varieties of sunflowers. Um, the, the most showy is probably the, the photo on the right here. This is um, Maximilian sunflower. It gets very tall, about 12 feet. Um, it's really great for um, prairies. Um, but then we also have some woodland sunflowers that are great in more shaded uh, type habitats. And it is um, a host for the silvery checker spot butterfly. And the seeds also are eaten um, by birds in the winter time as well. So another great fall option. So that was a lot of flowers. I just have like two more slides of plants. Um, and then I think we'll be almost ready to wrap up for questions. So lastly, I wanted to just, you know, give a, a, a shout out to um, trees and grasses and shrubs, because they are also um, really great to incorporate into our landscape. They provide a, a lot of different benefits. Um, and uh, the, the native tree selection I have here, um, you'll notice they have a little number in the bottom corner, and that is the number of moth and butterfly um, species that they um, host. So they are a larval host for that many butterfly and moth species. And this number is for the, the nation, not just Minnesota. We don't have that many uh, butterfly and moth species in our state. But just to hit home that they are providing a lot of um, resources for uh, these pollinators. So the first photo is a red maple um, at, with 285 um, uh, moth and butterfly species that it provides for. The photo right next to it is the American basswood or linden, uh, and that provides for 150 uh, moth and butterfly species. And then the lower left is uh, bur oak. So we have a lot of bur oak in Sherburne County. Um, we have really great habitat for bur oak, um, and they provide for 534 uh, butterfly and moth species. And then the photo on the um, bottom right of the trees is black cherry. And we have a couple other cherry species native to Minnesota um, that are great to incorporate into landscapes. And they provide for 456 different species of butterfly and moths. So really great to incorporate native trees um, because, and they, they provide more benefits than just for pollinators, you know, with shade and um, mitigating stormwater issues. Uh, so it's always great to add more native trees to our landscape as well, and a wide variety of trees, not just focusing on one species. And then real quickly, we have a couple shrubs. Um, this first shrub here is service berry, also known as June berry, because it produces its um, fruit in June. Um, and so it blooms really early in the spring, so it's another uh, shrub that's really great to have for those early emerging pollinators but then it later develops these uh, kind of dark blue uh, berries that are relished by birds. Uh, you are lucky to try to, to get some June berry before uh, birds get to them. Uh, and they are edible for people, they're very tasty. Um, and next to the June berry, we have lead plant. This is a very long lasting uh, prairie shrub and it doesn't get very tall. So it's really great to incorporate into 
uh, landscape if you don't want anything too tall. It has really unique silver leaves um, and uh, nice striking purple flowers. And like the prairie clovers, it is in the legume family. So it, um, it uh, fixes nitrogen just like uh, the prairie clover. So um, it's great for soil health as well. And then the last shrub is cranberry. And this is a great shrub to incorporate along shorelines or wetland edges. It has um, really nice white flowers, um, kind of late spring, early summer. They're great for pollinators. And then they develop these bright red um, berry-like fruits that are uh, really great for birds and other wildlife species. And then lastly, I did include some grasses. Um, incorporating native grasses into your landscape is very beneficial. It's something that people don't tend to think about when they're you know, trying to plant for pollinators, but they're actually uh, larval hosts for a lot of different butterflies. So um, the ones I'm including here are kind of the more ornamental of our native grasses. Some of them are actually already being used as ornamental um, grasses um, with kind of cultivated native varieties. So the first grass we have is prairie drop seed, and that is the larval host for the Dakota skipper butterfly. And then we have little blue stem, which is actually a larval host for nine different skipper butterflies. And then the last grass is hairy grandma. And the butterfly I mentioned earlier, the uncus skipper, uh, that's really only found in Sherburne County. This is uh, its host plant. So we need more hairy grandma in the sand dunes regions to help support those butterflies. And aside from pollinators, uh, uh, a lot of upland game birds, they prefer these native bunch grasses because it provides um, gaps in the grasslands where they can navigate through versus um, more sod forming grasses uh, like smooth brown, which is what you normally see um, you know, in disturbed areas. It was a very common pasture grass. Um, so great for both pollinators and wildlife. And I'll go through this one very quickly. These are um, just kind of um, noteworthy plants. They're not exactly powerhouses in terms of um, for, for pollinators, but they work really well in landscape settings. So if you want to try to incorporate native plants into your landscape, but um, want something that is a little more well-behaved or stays a little shorter, compact, um, these are really great options. Um, so we have butterfly weed. It does great in the sun. Uh, it helps with the monarch because it is in the milkweed family. Um, Virginia bluebells are really early spring blooming plant uh, that you kind of see in, in woodlands. So it likes that dappled sunlight before um, you know the full leaf canopy comes in. Dotted blazing star is a great prairie plant, it stays very short. There are other blazing star species that get a little taller, has a very unique spiky looking flower um, and monarchs absolutely love the, the nectar um, from blazing stars. Maiden hair fern, um, obviously not uh, really a pollinator plant, but it provides a really great ground cover in understories of woodlands. If you're struggling to get something to grow, um, uh, and you have bare soil that has erosion issues. Cardinal flower uh, is a great um, kind of shoreline plant if you have a little shade. Uh, hummingbirds really love it. It's one of the few like strikingly red flowers that we have that's native. And then prairie smoke is a really great ground cover for very dry soil. Uh, it is a prairie plant. And the, the photo I have here, this is actually in bloom. The flowers kind of droop down and they look closed. Um, so you really, bumblebees are kind of the only thing that can really pry open the flower to get at the pollen and nectar resources. Um, but when it goes to seed, the, the drooping flower head kind of props up and it almost looks like a plume of smoke. So that's where it gets its name. Wild ginger is another really great ground cover to incorporate into uh, shady planting. So if you have a tree that you, you can't get anything to grow under, wild ginger is a great ground cover for that. Has really um, nice looking heart-shaped leaves. The, the flower, you have to kind of move aside the leaves to really see. It's this kind of maroon colored um, appendage on the, the ground. 
and it is there to attract ground beetles. Um, and real quickly, um, having plants like that that attract beetles is really great for pest control because beetles will also prey on pest insects. Uh, so you don't have to use any pesticides or chemicals. And lastly, Canada anemone is another great ground cover. I've seen Canada anemone in, growing in you know, hot sunny spots along shorelines and woodlands. It is very adaptable, but it provides really great ground cover and these uh, leaves stay green all season. And it has these cute little white flowers kind of uh, late spring, early summer. So um, you can incorporate these native plants into your landscaping in a variety of ways. Um, rain gardens are a great example of using native plants. If you have a downspout, you can direct um, that into the rain garden. Those are usually just shallow depression gardens um, meant for collecting water and allowing it to infiltrate into the ground. And those deep root systems of native plants do a really good job of uh, allowing that water to infiltrate. Shoreline buffers are um, another great way to utilize native plants because they help stabilize the soil and provide a nice connector from the water to the land, which is really important for a lot of different wildlife um, in, in lake, the lake systems. Um, lawn alternatives is the only um, method that I mention the use of non-native plants. And that's because um, not a lot of native plants are well adapted to lawn type settings where there's a lot of foot traffic or frequent mowing. Um, but if you want to keep your lawn as it is, incorporating these shorter growing flowers is still a great way to increase um, uh, pollinator habitat. So the U of M actually developed a bee lawn mix that has uh, white clover, bell peel, and creeping thyme. They're all very short growing flowering plants um, that are also pretty drought tolerant. Um, so they do well in the summers. Um, but there's also native plants that will do well in areas where, you know, that you're struggling to get something to grow, but you don't necessarily need a lawn there. Um, this photo here I have is Pennsylvania sedge, which is a grass-like plant that does really well in um, understories in woodlands. And so another great option uh, for kind of a lawn alternative. And, once they uh, reach a certain height, the, the blades of uh, the sedge kind of flap over and look like a nice rolling meadow. And then, um, I believe this is the last content slide. Um, if you're, you know, you're interested in incorporating, you know, habitat with native flowers, we also kind of have to think about nesting habitat because a lot of pollinators, um, they don't, fly very far from where they're foraging. And so if you're providing a lot of native plants and flowers and things to attract pollinators, we really want to try to incorporate nesting habitat on your landscape as well. Um, and so for bees, most of our native bees, which we have about 400 of in the state of Minnesota, require pretty specific nesting habitats. Um, they, the ground nesting bees need bare ground to be able to actually dig their little nest. Um, and then you can even buy manufactured um, bee hotels as they're labeled for stem nesting bees. So they usually have hollow bamboo stems that um, the solitary bees can um, lay their larva in and provision. Um, but you can also leave standing stems. Like I mentioned, goldenrod is uh, great for stem nesting bees. Um, raspberry canes are also good, Joe pie weed. Um, any, um, stem that has kind of a pithy center that's pretty stable. And even just leaving a brush pile is great for um, bee habitat. Bumblebees really like those brush piles. Um, and something pretty simple to reduce your chores in the fall are just leaving your leaves. There's a lot of butterfly species that overwinter in leaf litter. And so if, if you have you know, those great native trees that are providing for um, butterflies and moths, but you're raking all the, the leaves out, out from underneath that tree, you're probably raking up larvae that are trying to sleep <laughs> there over the winter. So um, there's actually a leave your leave uh, campaign that the Xerxes Society started to try to encouraging people to um, keep the leaves on your property. It, it, you know, in areas where you can, like mainly your garden areas. Um, 
And then lastly, real quick, anytime you're incorporating you know, native habitat to your property, it's really good to provide signage uh, to let your neighbors know what you're doing um, or you know, for passerbys to see, and maybe they wanna do the same thing as well. It's really great to just incorporate signage. And so you're probably wondering, okay, you told me all about these great native plants. Where can I get these? I don't see them when I go to my local garden center. Um, that's because there are native specific nurseries that specialize in propagation of native plants because it does take a little bit um, uh, of different methods and techniques for that. So Minnesota is pretty lucky. We have a wide variety of native nurseries in the state. And the DNR has an extensive list of all of those nurseries. Um, so you can just Google you know, DNR native plant supplier list, or um, I can send um, resources and a follow-up after this presentation. Um, and this is kind of the Sherburne County area. And we have um, two native nurseries that are pretty close by uh, Prairie Restorations in Princeton and Minnesota Native Landscapes in Otsego. So you can get most of the native plants that I talked about at those two nurseries. And we are here to help the Sherburne SWCD. You know, we uh, provide both technical and sometimes financial assistance. Um, you know, we, we uh, hold site visits with landowners um, during the field season uh, to answer any questions and help with plant selection and maintenance. Um, and if you qualify for one of our financial assistance programs, we can um, help um, with some of the cost of a project as well. And I just threw up some of the resources where I got a lot of my information. You don't need to copy down these websites. I will include them in a follow-up um, email because I know we're getting pretty close to the time and I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I will just move on and we can, Take care of any questions that have come up in the chat, or if you um, would rather just ask your question out loud, um, we can do that as well. So, see. Brittany, can you see the chat? Yes, I can, yes. Okay. So yeah, I see. The Rusty Patch, yeah, the Rusty Patch bumblebee has been found. Uh, I didn't know it was found at the Holton Conservation Area. That's great. I knew it was found in the uh, Sand Dunes State Forest. Um, so that's great to hear. Um, okay, do you have any recommendations for types of clover in place of grass in sandy shaded areas? Hmm. Um, clover usually likes sun, um, but there are uh, depending on how you use the area, like if you don't walk on it, um, oops. Um, some of those species I mentioned, like uh, wild ginger does really great in shady areas. So does Virginia water leaf and both of those um, are really great at spreading and acting like a ground cover. Um, but violets are also another good thing to incorporate in um, uh, shaded areas in lawns. Uh, they do really well. Um, and also, do you have a recommendation for native plant that can plant by seed on my lakeside? Uh, yes, um, sedges are actually really good along uh, lake shores and shorelines, um, incorporating those in conjunction with flowers because sedges have those really fibrous root systems. Um, that hold the soil. So sedges are great. Um, sneezeweed is a really uh, showy yellow flower that does well along shorelines. Um, it has a terrible name because <laughs> I feel like a lot of people think it's gonna cause allergies, um, but most flowers honestly that are pollinated, they don't cause allergies because their pollen is so heavy. Um, so hopefully that helps. I can um, uh, provide a little more um, plant list too in my follow-up. Um, yes, I will. So I will be sending um, all of the resources that I had on my last slide um, in a follow-up email. So you don't have to worry about um, trying to remember all of that information. Um, and this presentation is also being recorded. So it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And I will send out that link when it's up on our YouTube channel as well. So you can always look back 
um, on some of the things that I mentioned as well. Are there any more questions? I know that was a lot of information to throw at you. Uh, oxide in the pollen of the garden gets covered with red mites every fall. Any alternative yellow plant? Um, goldenrod is a great yellow plant for fall. Um, if you wanted something uh, in the spring, there are two different kinds of coreopsis, native coreopsis that are really great that um, kind of have that similar flower shape. Um, and sunflowers are also a really great fall um, yellow plant alternative too. Anything else? I think we, we are at, oh, we still got a little bit of time, that's good. Um, and you all have my email. So um, if you have any questions you think of later on, feel free to you can send me an email. Other than that, if there are no other questions, I think we can call it for the evening so you guys can um, continue on with your evening plans. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope you got something out of the presentation. <laughs>